All right, welcome to the complete immunology review for the USMLE. In this video, we're going to talk about all the high yield immunology that we need to know for the USMLE and Comlex, and we're going to go through 150 questions. All questions are available at my website at ajmonics.com. Questions in the comments that you have, you can direct to ajmonics at gmail.com. So let's jump right in with question number one. B cell maturation occurs in the bone marrow or the thymus? In the bone marrow. That's why they're called B cells. It's not a mnemonic. That's really why they're called B cells, because they mature in the bone marrow. As opposed to T cells, they're called T cells because they mature in the thymus. They originate in the bone marrow, but they end up in the thymus. And over here, we see the bees inside the bone marrow. <laughs> Again, they're not really bees, of course. They just remind us that B, the B cells mature in the bone marrow. Here we actually have the B cells. We'll take a closer look at this picture really soon when we talk about the germinal centers. Okay, B cell proliferation occurs in the lymph node, follicle or paracortex. Which part of the lymph node? It's the follicle. Not really follicle. I call it follicle to remind me of B cells in the follicle. B cells proliferate in the follicle, as opposed to the paracortex. That's where the T cells are. And over here, I just produced this animation over here where we see the lymph node, and in purple we see the follicle or the follicle, and in blue underneath it we see the paracortex. The follicle is in the cortex. That's the green surrounding it over there. So again, purple follicle, blue paracortex. Follicle is where the B cells are. Paracortex is where the T cells are. Question number three. Secondary follicles are dense and inactive or pale in the center and active. So this reminds me of histology. And they are pale in the center and are active. We'll see the histology in a second. We just see a picture of the B cells proliferating over here in the center, in the pale center over here. And in the histology we see over here, we see the germinal center, pale in the center. And again, another histologic picture where we see number three. Three is pointing to the pale centers, the germinal centers, representing B cell proliferation. Question number four, medullary sinuses contain T cells or reticular cells and macrophages. They contain the reticular cells and the macrophages. And we can see that again in the picture of this 3D model of the lymph node. In the center, we have the medullary sinuses containing the reticular cells and macrophages. The paracortex is deficient in patients with, well, what's the paracortex for again? The paracortex. Tex is for T cells. So is that going to be in agamogobulin anemia? No, it's going to be in a syndrome where we see deficient T cells, the George syndrome, where we see deficient T cells. Question number six, the spleen is protected by, so this is like an anatomy tie-in, where we're talking about the location of an immune-associated organ. So where is it going to be? Ribs 9 and 11 on the left. And we see abdominal CAT scan of that over here. You see the spleen by ribs number 9 and 11 on the left. And we see a cross-section over here. We see the spleen on the left. All right. Question number seven, patients who undergo splenectomy have an increased risk for susceptibility to encapsulated organisms due to deficient complement activation. That's because people without a spleen or without a functional spleen will have lower levels, significantly lower levels of IgM. What's IgM important for? Complement activation. So without this complement activation, there will be an increased risk of susceptibility to encapsulated organisms, mainly Neisseria and strep pneumonia, or, or most notably Neisseria and strep pneumonia. Question number eight, which of the following are associated with a splenectomy? So which of these findings, how will jolly bodies, target cells, thrombocytosis, lymphocytosis, or all of the above? Well, it's all of the above. And I'm going to talk about A and B over here. What's a how will jolly body? Well, it's a pathologic finding. Normally, we don't see how will jolly bodies because it, there's like this little dot in the middle of the red blood cell. It's a weird looking red blood cell, right? Really, really weird. Who's responsible of removing really weird cells, we really weird red blood cells at least, at the spleen? So since we don't have a spleen, then these how will jolly bodies will be seen. And that's exactly why target cells will also be seen. Target cells are these weird looking cells associated with various conditions. We'll talk about what those conditions are in a second. Normally the spleen is responsible for removing these weird looking red blood cells, but since we don't have the spleen, we're gonna have the presence of target cells. Okay, antigen presenting cells capture circulating pathogens in the pals of the spleen or marginal zone of the spleen. It's the marginal zone of the spleen. We ma the marginal zone of the spleen is between the red pulp and the white pulp. We see the red pulp and white pulp circled in red over here. Between them is the marginal zone. Actually, in some sources, they indicate that the marginal zone is part of the red pulp. So again, what we were saying is that the antigen presenting cells, they capture circulating pathogens for recognition by lymphocytes in this location. PALs contain the, the T cells. Question 10, the thymus epithelium is derived from the second or third pharyngeal pouch. That's going to be from the third pharyngeal pouch. This one's also associated with de George syndrome because in de George syndrome, we have a problem with the development of the third pharyngeal pouch leading to lack of the thymus. Question number 11, when TLRs, toll-like receptors recognize PAMPs, PAMPs, then what is activated, LPS or NF-kappa B? Well, it's not LPS. LPS is a type of PAMP. It's the prototypical PAMP. It's rather gonna lead to activation of NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B, it's a protein complex that controls transcription of DNA, cytokine production, as well as self-survival. By the way, which drugs inhibit NF-kappa B? Glucocorticoids, that's how they work. 
Question 12. MHC class 1 binds. We know this. CD8 cells, right? The mnemonic, 4 times 2 is 8, and 8 times 1 is 8, okay? By the way, what are MHC molecules encoded by? Which genes? The HLA genes. Question 13. MHC1 is composed of long chain or long chain and short chain? Long chain and short chain. We see in green here the long chain, and in purple, the beta-2 microglobulin, sh microglobulin short chain, as opposed to MHC2. What does that have? It has two chains that are the same length, an alpha-1, alpha-2 chain, and beta-1, beta-2 chain. Question 14. MHC2 is present on all nucleated cells? Nope. That's MHC class 1. MHC class 2 is on antigen-presenting cells. Question 15. NK cells are induced to kill when? What is not present? When MHC class 1 is not present. This is a really, really cool mechanism, meaning most things get activated in the presence of something, right? Natural killer cells get activated in the absence of something. If they see that there's no MHC class 1, then they're activated. Meaning what you could say is that natural killer cells are inhibited by self-MHC class 1. Question 16. HLEB27 is associated with, this is an association that we really need to know, ankylosing spondylitis. There are actually some other conditions, and these are the pair conditions. Psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, IBD-associated arthritis, and reactive arthritis are all associated with HLAB27. All right, we just have a picture that I made in my HLA video. Not the greatest video, but I like this one over here where we see the Bs, the pair of Bs, pair for pair, and the Bs remind us of B, so we have B, and they're around the B27. And again, pair just reminds us of this mnemonic for the four conditions associated with HLA-B27. Question 17, HLA-DR3 is associated with, this is going to be diabetes mellitus type 1 and Hashimoto thyroiditis, where I had this Dr. 3 for HLA-DR3, the tree was for 3. He had a grave on him for Graves' disease. He had the diabetes with melons for diabetes mellitus, diabetes mellitus type 1. There was an ad sun back of him. There was like an ad sign on the sun for Addison's disease. There are hash browns on his foot for Hashimoto, and under him there was a slide for SLE. SLE. And I just had another picture in that video of hemochromatosis, which is associated with HLA A3, and it had the Heman and the Google Chrome sign for HLA A3. Question 18 HLA DR4 is associated with, right, four corners to a room for rheumatoid arthritis. Question 19 Which T cell survives positive selection? What's positive selection all about? So it's double positive T cells that can bind to self MHC, right? This is important. We want our T cells to recognize our own M MHC. Right? If our T cells can't recognize their own MHC, then they can't do their job. For example, to activate other cells, we want our T cells to be able to, to, to bind to MH, self MHC. And if they can't do that, they don't survive positive selection. So what happens is the thymic epithelial cells present self MHC to the T cells. And only the T cells that recognize this self MHC will survive. Now, the problem is we don't want to bind too tightly to these peptides of self MHC because that would lead to immunity against ourselves or to immunity. And that's what negative selection is all about. In negative selection, we make sure that we're not binding too tightly to self-MHC. Let's say we have the uh, presence of positive selection, but we have a defect in negative selection. What's that going to lead to? Of course, autoimmunity. And that's exactly what autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome is all about. There's, a, there's a, the presence of positive selection, but we don't have negative selection. We'll discuss more of that soon. Question 20. In negative selection, what occurs to T-cells expressing T-cell receptors with high affinity self-antigen? We just said this. If we're binding too tightly to self antigen, then the T cells will not survive and they're going to go undergo apoptosis. By the way, they don't only have to undergo apoptosis, they can actually turn into Tregs. Question 21 Regulatory T cells express CD16 and CD56 or choice B? And the answer is choice B CD3, CD4, CD25, and FOXP3. I had a fun video on that that I produced actually yesterday, but I didn't post yet. So the T Rex represents T Regs, T Rex for T Regs. And he had a tree on his head for three, a door on his head for four, the twin hives for 25. That represents CD3, CD4, CD25. And in his pouch, we actually see three foxes for FOXP3. Question 22. Regular T cells release. What do they release? Well, what's important for suppressing immunity? IL-10 and TGF beta. As opposed to IL-2, IL-2 stimulates growth of T cells and natural killer cells, and interferon gamma stimulates macrophages to kill phagocytose pathogens and to form granulomas. But in terms of suppression of immunity, that's IL-10 and TGF beta. Th1 cells are responsible for activating macrophages and cytotoxic T cells or inducing neutrophilic inflammation. It's going to be A, activating macrophages and cytotoxic T cells. And I have a picture of that over here where I, in my video, I had a teacup with the gun for one, and he was activating the macrophage to kill the phagocytose pathogen. Th1 class switching is inhibited by, is going to be inhibited by, inhibited by a Th2 system. What's the Th2 system? That involves IL-4 and IL-10. And the opposite is true also. The Th1 system wants to inhibit the Th2 system. So interferon gamma, which is part of Th1, is going to inhibit the production of IL-4 and IL-10. 
All right, question 25, TH2 cells secrete. We just gotta remember, and we just discussed it, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-10. And again, IL-10 is important for immune suppression. Question 26, tissue restricted self antigens are expressed in the thymine dull due to the action of air. Air is the one that is involved in negative selection where we present various peptides to the T cells and the ones that bind too tightly are going to undergo apoptosis or turn into Tregs. Question 27, and we spoke about this before, what would an air deficiency lead to? So an air deficiency would lead to autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome. What's involved in autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome? We're gonna see chronic mucotaneous candidiasis. We're gonna see hypoparathyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, and recurrent candida infections, all right? This is a very rare disease. In America, it affects like one out of three million babies. That means like only one time every year in the entire US, a baby with this is born. More in other countries, but in the US, it happens only about once every year that a baby with this syndrome is born. Question 28, FOXP3 deficiency leads to, well, FOXP3 deficiency is going to lead to a condition known as IPEX. We just have to remember what IPEX stands for. IPEX stands for Immune Dysregulation, Polyendocrinopathy, Enteropathy, and X-Linked Syndrome. So that's gonna be choice A. And it's actually dermatitis and uh, nail problems as well. This IPEX is also very rare. This affects like one out of 1.6 million people. Question 29, during T-cell activation, the second signal involves, so is it B7 or CD40? CD40, no, it's not choice B, that's B cells. Choice A, B B7 on the APC communicates with CD28 on the naive T cell. And I just have a picture from my website of this video where we see the antigen presenting cell presenting antigen in the context of MHC to the T cell and the B on the 7-up can for B7 binds with a CD that says 28 on it for B CD28. So again, B7 binds with CD28 on the T cell. All right, question number 30. Cytotoxic T cells are most similar to Natural killer cells, right? Both of them use perforin and granzyme dependent systems where they induce cell lysis of various target cells, including tumor cells and viruses. Question 31, which immunoglobulin fixes complement? We know this already, IgM and IgG. IgM in the earlier response and IgG in the later response. Which one has the highest ability to fix complement? That's going to be IgM because it has so many available spaces, five times the amount. It's a pentamer in its secreted form. Okay, question 32, the immunoglobulin light chain contributes to the FAB region or FC region? It's going to be the FAB region. Let's take a look at the picture of that where we see the FAB region. I always thought it looked like a claw and the rest of it looked like an arm. So I like to call it the fabulous claw. Fabulous claw because fab for fabulous, well, fabulous for fab is the in the claw region and the rest of it is the FC region. Question 33, the immunoglobulin light chain contributes to the FC region or the FAB and FC region, and it's going to be the, both the FAB and FC region. And we see a picture of that over here in blue and in yellow, is that yellow, beige, I don't know. But we see that the light chain is contributing both to the FAB and to the FC region. Question 34, which portion determines the immunoglobulin idiotype? The FC region or the FAB region? And that's going to be the FAB region. So the FC region is going to be the, determine the isotype, not the idiotype. Question 35, naive beta cells, even before activation express, IgM and IgG, or IgM and IgG, it's going to be IgM and IgD. IgM is actually produced first, and then IgD, but both of these are produced before B cell activation, while it's still a naive B cell. Question 36, which immunoglobulin is the most abundant in the serum? This is going to be IgG, making up about 80% of our immunoglobulin in the blood. Which immunoglobulin protects against Giardia? This is going to be IgA, IgA protects the mucosal surfaces, and Giardia is one that infects the mucosa, and I have a picture of that over here from my video. This guy, I don't know why his skin is not showing over here, but it says, I guard mucous membranes because he likes to guard mucous membranes. And we see the dimer of IgA, the way it's secreted as a dimer, okay? So IgA is protecting, protects against Giardia lamblia, and that's why in selective IgA deficiency, we see increased risk of Giardia lamblia infection. Question 38, which immunoglobulin is released in tear saliva and breast milk? And that's going to be IgA. We know IgA is in tear saliva and in breast milk. And I have a picture of that over here where I see this guy who worked with hay, I guess he's a farmer, Hey, for IgA, and he's crying and tearing, tears and crying, reminds us of tears and saliva, well, he's salivating, and they're probably trickling down towards his breast, reminds us of breast milk, and again, this reminds us that tears, saliva, and breast milk contains IgA. Question 38 again, I guess, so it really is question 39, which immunoglobin is responsible for the immediate response to antigen? The immediate response, the immediate response, IgM. IgM is in the immediate response, IgG is associated with the uh, chronic response, or the later response. Question 39, immunity against eosinophils is mediated by IgE, and we see a picture of that over here where we see IgE activating the eosinophils, and by the way, also mast cells. That's why we see the mast cell in the picture over here. Question 40, the classical complement pathway is mediated by 
IgG and IgM, as the famous mnemonic goes, GM makes classic cars. GM is part of the classical pathway. And we see the three pathways over here. We see the classical pathway, the lectin pathway, and the alternative pathway. Lectin pathway involves mannose residues, residues, and the alternative pathway involves bacteria, toxins, or bacteria. I don't even know what thick over is. Okay, C3B produced in the complement pathway is responsible for opsonization. We see the macrophage trying to eat this bacteria over here, this gram-negative bacteria. Maybe Neisseria or something? Probably not, actually. But anyway, we see complement C3B. We see C3B over here as that's coding the gram-negative bacteria. So that's what C3B does. It opsonizes and prepares the bacteria for phagocytosis by the macrophage. By the way, what else is an opsonin? IgG. Question 42, what other functions does C3B have? Well, this is easy to remember. It helps to clear immune complexes. And the reason why this is easy to remember is because it functions the same way as it did in terms of opsonization. It opsonizes and prepares the bacteria for phagocytosis, and it also kind of like opsonizes or coats various immune complexes for clearance. So that's how C3B works. By the way, in which disease do we see widespread immune complex deposition? SLE. So patients with decreased levels of C3B, what are we going to see? An increased risk for the development of SLE because we're not going to be able to get rid of widespread deposition. Okay, question 43. C3A producing the complement pathway is responsible for chemotaxis or mediating anaphylaxis? Mediating anaphylaxis. Neutrophil chemotaxis, we'll talk about the agents responsible for that soon. But over here in the picture, we see the three A's. The girl looks at the three A's, so, so, so she sees three A's. C's three A's for C3A, and this cause, causes her to have an anaphylactic reaction. Hypersensitivity type 1 mediated, and we'll talk about that later. Question 44, which bacteria is the MAC complex most noted for neutralizing? Staph or Neisseria? Remember, a complement leads to MAC complex. All three pathways lead to the MAC complex, which is required for lysis of encapsulated organisms, especially Neisseria. And here we just see the MAC complex doing its work, working on the cell membrane, probably of something like Neisseria. Question 45, which molecule inhibits or molecules inhibit complement activation on self cells, right? We don't want cells to be destroyed by complement. So how do we protect cells from complement? cd 55 also known as DAF. DAF is GPI anchored and inhibits, it inhibits which parts of the complement pathway? C3 and C5 convertase. So that's what DAF protects against. CD5, also known as DAF, protects against that. C5 to C9 is responsible for production of the MAC complex. By the way, there's another molecule also, Merle. Merle is also involved. Not only DAF, but Merle. Okay, we'll talk about that later. CD, <laughs> again, question 46. What does C3 convertase do? Does it cleave C3 or C5? It cleaves C3. C3 convertase cleaves C3. And again, keep in mind that all three pathways, complement pathways, converge on C3 convertase then on C5 convertase, and then the MAC complex. So that's like the end result of all three of the pathways. Question 47, recurrent pyogenic sinus and respiratory infections are seen in early complement deficiencies or an LAD, leukocyte adhesion deficiency? Early complement deficiencies, leukocyte adhesion deficiency, we won't see pyogenic um, infections. We'll talk about that later. Here we're focusing on the early complement deficiencies, like C1 to C4. If there's a deficiency in this, it leads to the deficiency in complement, and therefore there will be an increased risk of susceptibility to things like strep pneumonia and hemophilus influenza type B. All right, we see recurrent pyogenic infections and sinus and respiratory tract infections. Question 48, hereditary angioedema will be seen in terminal complement deficiencies or in C1S race inhibitor deficiency? C1S race inhibitor deficiency. In a hereditary angioedema, what we see, this is uh, due to overactivation of complement. How do we have overactivation of complement? Well, we inhibit C1 esterase. If we inhibit C1 esterase, then C1 and the complement pathway will be overactivated. Complement activation leads to vasodilation and edema, and therefore we're going to see a lot of this, especially periorbital edema. That's the most classic finding, and I have the picture of that over here, the periorbital edema caused by the overactivation of complement. Question 49, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, one of my favorite diseases, very cool mechanism, involves a defect in the formation of, that's Daff and Merle. Daff and Merle, as we said, is responsible for stopping the complement system on, on one's own cells. And this is what happens in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. It's actually caused by a defect in the PIGA gene, which prevents formation of these GPI anchors. The GPI anchors are there to connect Daff and Merle. So if we don't have the GPI anchors, 
We have a defective formation of CD55 and CD59. Those are Daphne Merle. The other names are Daphne Merle. And therefore, complement is going to act on itself, leading to intravascular hemolysis now, and, and as well as dark urine. And why is it called paroxysmal nocturnal? Why is it nocturnal? Because this classically happens at nighttime. Because classically at nighttime, a person hypoventilates, leading to decreased pH. There's more acidity. There's more, it's more of an acidic environment with the increased carbon dioxide. And since it's an acidic environment, acid classically activates the complement system. So the complement system is going to be activated. And what's it activated against? Self. It's activated against self, leading to intravascular hemolysis. And that's why at nighttime, where there's decreased pH and we have more acidity and the complement pathway is going to be activated, we see more of this dark urine because it's going to be an increased intravascular hemolysis at nighttime due to overactivation of complement against self at night. Question 50, IL-1 is responsible for neutrophil chemotaxis or mediating fever inflammation. We know this, mediating fever inflammation. Again, IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha are responsible for mediating fever. Neutrophil chemotaxis, again, we'll talk about later. By the way, how do we reduce fever? Is it by acting against IL-1? No, it has nothing to do with IL-1. We take aspirin, what it does, it, rocks, it stops the prostaglandins from acting on the hypothalamus and telling the hypothalamus to raise the temperature. So that's, what, that's how aspirin and other of those medications work is that they act on the prostaglandins, nothing to do with IL-1 and TNF-alpha. And here we just have a picture in my video. We had the guy in IL-1 at the store and he was shooting his gun, which created a fire and the bone and the skeleton was exploding, reminds of the bone resorption. And you can take a look at that video. Question 51, we have IL-2 is responsible for, what's IL-2 responsible for? It's responsible for stimulating growth of natural killer cells and T-cells, T-cells and natural killer cells. Now, where do we see, for example, IL-2 therapy used? Why would a person take IL-2 therapy? It's most classically associated with renal cell carcinoma, where it regulates the activity of white blood cells. Okay, so IL-2 therapy can be used where we want to stimulate the growth of T-cells and natural killer cells, for example, in renal cell carcinoma. Question 52, IL-3 is responsible for supporting growth of bone marrow stem cells or supporting growth of B cells? And the answer is gonna be, bone marrow stem cell. I have a picture of that over here where I had to see the, the tree for three growing and it somehow stimulates the growth of this bone marrow over here. Okay, so IL-3 for three bone, bone marrow stem cells. Question 53, IL-4 is responsible for enhancing class switching or promoting TH2 class switching and it's going to be promoting TH2 class switching. There's a mnemonic, first aid mnemonic, to beg for help. Two for TH2 cells, beg for B cells and IgE, IgG class switching and help for helper T cells and TH2 cells. Choice B, TH2 cells. Question 54, IL-5 is responsible for promoting growth and differentiation of cells, of B cells, or inducing TH1 class switching. It's going to be A, promoting growth and differentiation of B cells as well. What, is, what else does IL-5 do? Enhancing class switching to IgA, stimulating the growth of eosinophils as well. It does not induce TH1 class switching. IL-8 is responsible for, finally, we get up to our neutrophil recruiters, neutrophil recruitment. We have the interesting mnemonic, which I em embellished on over here in this video, CO at 5 or B4. No, I'll be late. So CO at 5 for C5, C5A. I'll be late for LTB, LTB4. And no, I'll be late for IL-8. So it's all leads to neutrophil recruitment. Question 56, IL-10 is responsible for. What's IL-10 responsible for? We know this already. Attenuating the immune response. We already had the question on this. IL-10 and TGF-beta. Question 57, TNF-alpha is responsible for, what's tuna fish elephant for? <laughs> tuna fish elephant TNF-alpha is responsible for activating endothelium. TNF-alpha causes white blood cell recruitment it as well, and it's involved in maintaining granulomas, for example, in tuberculosis. What else does TNF-alpha do? It mediates fever, just like IL-1 and IL-6. Question 58, interferon gamma is responsible for, what's interferon gamma for? That's stimulating macrophages to kill. We spoke about this already, actually. It, and we spoke about the fact that it inhibits TH2 cell differentiation. What else is interferon gamma for? It induces IgG class switching, interferon gamma for IgG, and it also promotes granuloma um, formation. So, so two, the three Gs we have, interferon gamma promotes granuloma formation and induces IgG class switching. Question 59, interferons play a major role in defense against cancer. One method is, for example, by recruiting other immune cells. That's how interferons are used in cancers. All right, question 60. The marker for hematomatic stem cells is CD56 or CD34. Hematomatic stem cells are CD34. I have a picture of Manhattan 34th Street over here where we see this stem cell growing. <laughs> this stem over here growing reminds of stem cells. So again, hematomatic stem cells are CD34 positive. Question 61. Helper and cytotoxic T cells all express. What do they all express? Not CD4. It's actually going to be. CD3, right? Cytotoxic T cells have CD8, not CD4, but all of them have CD3. CD3 is involved in the actual 
activation. Um, so both cytotoxic and helper T cells are CD3 positive. That's actually a marker sometimes for the presence of T cells because all T cells have CD3. We use this, for example, in flow cytometry where everyone is going to be CD3 positive. Question 62, CD19 to CD21 are associated with B cells. For example, rituximab is a CD20 monoclonal antibody. It acts against B cells by targeting CD20. CD6, <laughs> I did this again. Question 63, CD16 and CD56 are markers for natural killer cells. Someone once told me that in 1656, the natural killers were released from prison. The natural killers were released from prison in 1656, the year 1656. This reminds us that CD16 and CD56 are associated with the natural killer cells. Question 64, CD4 and CD25 are markers for regulatory T cells. Remember, we mentioned this already, along with FOXP3, right? The, the, the Tregs, represented by the Trex, has the foxes in his pouch for FOXP3. Question 65, which molecule is important for reactive oxidation species neutralization? We know this, NADPH, right? NADPH is required for NADPH oxidase, as well as for re regeneration of glutathione. Oxygen is converted to superoxide by which molecule? NADPH oxidase. When is NADPH oxidase deficient in chronic granulomatous disease? Patients with granul chronic granulomatous disease who are deficient H oxidase acquire hydrogen peroxide. This is one of the coolest things in all of the immunology. How do patients with chronic granulomatous disease acquire hydrogen peroxide if they can't use NADPH oxidase? Right? They don't have it. So how do they get? How do they acquire hydrogen peroxide? They steal it from the pathogens. They steal it from the catalase negative pathogens, the organisms. They can't steal it from the catalase positive organisms because the catalase positive organisms are, have catalase and they're breaking down their own. <laughs> they're breaking down their own hydrogen peroxide. With the catalase negative organisms, they could take the hydrogen peroxide from them and use it. Question 69, the, the respiratory burst leads to, this is a terrible question, but it's okay that once in a while I have a terrible question, potassium influx due to some polarization of the phagosome membrane. I don't get it. Sorry, I put this question in here. If you get this on test day and you answer potassium influx, just so you'll thank me one day. Question 70, rotavirus vaccine is, we're up to vaccines now, is a live attenuated virus. The mnemonic goes, and I, I built on this in my video, attention teachers, please vaccinate small, beautiful young infants Small, beautiful young infants with MMR routinely. Routine, so this represents all live attenuated vaccine, represented by this guy who's alive over here. So rotavirus rep is represented by routinely, rotavirus is a live attenuated vaccine. Question 71, live attenuated vaccines are safe or unsafe for patients with CD4 count bigger than 200? So an HIV patient taking a live attenuated vaccine? Yes, it's safe. As long as their CD4 count is above 200, it's going to be safe. Oh, I have another question 71. Interesting. Hepatitis A vaccine is a killed vaccine or a live attenuated vaccine. Hepatitis A is a killed vaccine. The second part of the mnemonic goes, a trip could kill you. So A is rep it represents hepatitis A. And trip is going to be for typhoid, rabies, influenza, and polio. Influenza, when we say that, we refer to the injection, right? The influenza intranasal is actually live. And a could kill you is the salk form of polio. Intramuscular influenza vaccine, I already gave it away, is not live. That's the intranasal. The intramuscular one is killed, killed vaccine, okay? The intranasal one is not given to all people. It's not given, for example, to children less than two or to older adults. That's for, that's actually called flumist. So that's the intranasal one that's live. Question 73, HPV is toxoid or recombinant? Not toxoid. The only toxoid ones are carinobacterium diphtheriae and tetany. So this was a recombinant one. And I have the third part of the mnemonic over here on the side. You can take a look at that or the video. Question 74, hemophilus influenza type B is a toxoid? No, not toxoid. We already mentioned what the toxoid ones are. It's a polysaccharide conjugate vaccine. So your carnitic theorem diphtheria is toxoid and tetany toxoid, okay? Question 78, mRNA vaccines. What's an mRNA vaccine? Well, the vaccine against COVID. mRNA vaccines, although generally safe, may cause pericarditis as well as myocarditis. So pericarditis and myocarditis are rare, rare findings in patients who take um, for example, the COVID vaccine, just something that we should be aware of as, um, as doctors. PPSV23 is given to the infants or elderly. That one's for the elderly. Type 1, hypersensitivity reactions begins when? When does it begin? When antigen crosslinks preformed IgE on mast cells, right? That's how the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction begins. The eosinophils are recruited later on in the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Anaphylaxis is an example of 
hypersensitivity type 1 reaction. All right, moving right along. Question number 82. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia is due to hypersensitivity type 1 or type 2? That's a classic type 2. Remember, type 2 is all about antibodies, antibodies binding, leading to cell destruction or leading to inflammation. Type 1 involves IgE, but type 2 involves the antibodies seen in autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Which antibodies do we see in autoimmune hemolytic anemia? Well, we see IgG and IgM, the two different forms, all right? Cold and warm forms. Question 83, myasthenia gravis involves A, type 1 or type 2? That's going to be type 2. There are antibodies, specific antibodies against the postsynaptic neuromuscular junction. This leads to blockage where the patient will then develop muscle weakness, ptosis, and respiratory distress. What association do we see in myasthenia gravis? With the thymus. Some patients undergo thymectomy in order to treat the condition. Question 84, the direct Coombs test, what does it do? It's direct. It detects antibodies attached directly to red blood cell surfaces. We want to see that ant the red blood cells have been coated with antigen, with antibodies. Question 85, type 3 hypersensitive reactions involve antigen antibody complexes activating complement or direct cell type of toxicity? The answer is A. This is the, um, the prototypical one is, for example, serum sickness, where we see this antigen antibody complex activating complement. Prototypical... <laughs> this is our question right here. What's the prototypic hypersensitivity type 3? That is serum sickness. Serum sickness. It's called serum sickness because it was first noted in individuals exposed to horse serum and it caused serum sickness. And the cardinal features of this are, for example, rash, fever, polyarthralgias, polyarthritis. And it doesn't begin right away. It begins one to two weeks after the first exposure to the agent involved, whatever medication it may be. And although the patients feel like terrible and they look terrible, the disease is self-limited and prognosis is great once they stop taking the medication. Question 87, in serum sickness, serum C3 and C4 levels will be reduced or elevated. They'll be reduced, right? We're using C3 and C4 to deposit in tissues. They're being used up. So they'll be reduced in the serum. How is the hypersensitivity type 4 reaction unique? Well, how is it unique? It's interesting, it does not involve immunoglobulins, right? Type one involves IgE, type two involves all antibodies, type three involves antigen antibody complexes, and type four is the only one that doesn't involve any immunoglobulins. It involves either direct cell cytotoxicity with CD8, or it involves CD4 effector, CD4 cells recognizing antigen. Question 89, Crept versus host disease involves, really boring question, hypersensitivity type four, that's a classic hypersensitivity type four reaction. Anti-postsynaptic acetylcholine receptor antibodies are seen in, we did this already with the myasthenia gravis. Oh, myasthenia gravis. lambert -Eaton involves presynaptic calcium channels. 91, which marker is more specific for SLE? Anti-Smith or ANA? It's going to be anti-Smith. Even though ANA is a marker for SLE, it's not as specific. And for that, I have this woman over here with uh, SLE. We have butterfly rash over here. And she does not like the Smith. She's anti-Smith. And that's the more specific marker. 92, antihistamine audio antibodies are seen in, which you gotta remember, drug-induced lupus, not associated with SLE. By the way, what other marker is seen in SLE? What else do we look for in SLE? Anti-double-stranded DNA. 93, anti-U1 RNP antibodies are seen in, we discussed this in our biochemistry discussion, mixed connective tissue disease. Anti-Rho and anti la are seen in Sjogren's, also known as anti-SSA and anti-SSB, SS standing for Sjogren's syndrome. Question 95, which autoantibody is more specific for rheumatoid arthritis? Anti-CCP, that's the more specific one. Even though it's called the rheumatoid, you might think it's that one because it's rheumatoid arthritis. It's actually anti-cyclic citrullinated peptide. Okay, question 96, antibiotic control antibodies are seen in primary biliary cholangitis. 97, anti-TSH receptor antibodies are seen in. Well, as long as you understand the mechanism, where do we see these anti-TSH receptor antibodies? Graves disease, we'll discuss more about this, more of this in pathology when we discuss the endocrine system. Question 98, tissue transglutaminous antibodies will be seen in celiac disease. That defines the disease. We see antibodies against gliadin and specifically tissue transglutaminous antibodies. What's seen in bolus pemphigoid? We see antihemidesmosomes. That's seen in bolus pemphigoid. Question 99, anticholinergic base membrane antibodies will be seen in good pastures. In Alport, we see problems with the basement membrane, but not these antibodies. Question 100, a defect in the BTK gene leads to, so what disease is this? A gamma globulinemia, also known as Bruton's globulinemia. so Bruton. So a defect would lead to, what do we see in this disease? Well, we see a problem with the development and maturation of B cells. We don't see any of it, no B cell maturation. So if we don't have B cell maturation, we have a problem with bacterial and antiviral infections. Absence of thymic shadow would be seen, for example, in problem with the T cells, 
for example, to George's syndrome, where we see absolutely an absence of the thymic shadow on chest x-ray. Question 101. Whether the following is true regarding selective IgA deficiency, so may cause a false negative celiac disease test? Yes, definitely. And it is generally asymptomatic, but it may cause a false negative celiac disease, and we'll talk about that more. Not only is there this association over here, but patients with IgA deficiency are way more likely to develop a problem in immune response to gliadin, that is, celiac disease. So if a patient has uh, IgA deficiency, they're very likely to develop celiac disease. Question one is due. CVID is due to? So this is common variable immunodeficiency. This is due to not absent B-cell maturation. That was agamma globulinemia. It's defective B-cell differentiation. So we're going to see a problem with defect in the differentiation. There, there may be a maturation, but it's differentiation that's the problem. And therefore, what are we going to see? We're going to see increased risk of developing lymphoma and bronchiectasis. And the disease is usually diagnosed after puberty. 104, 22Q11, so this is a uh, thymic aplasia, the George syndrome, we're gonna see hypocalcemia. We're gonna see hypocalcemia, and this is due to the problem with the parathyroids. We don't have the proper development of the parathyroids due to the failure of, failure of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches to develop. Third and fourth has, provides for the parathyroids, and if we're not gonna see the parathyroids, we're gonna see problem in calcium, and if we're hypocalcemia, and by the way, what happens when you get hypocalcemia? You get, easier time firing an action potential, which is why these patients present with tetany, because they're always, they're constantly firing these action potentials due to the hypocalcemia. 105, patients with the Jordan syndrome often have albinism. We, I would say we see that in Chidiakagashi syndrome, rather conic, um, truncal defects, defects with the outflow vessels of the heart, such as, such as tetralogy of flow and truncus arteriosus. Question 106, patients with IL-12 receptive deficiency have an increased susceptibility to IL-12, non-tuberculosis, mycobacterial diseases. Question 107, STAT3 mutations lead to, so STAT3 mutation, what's that seen in? That's seen in autosomal dominant hyper IgE syndrome. This leads to a deficiency of TH17 cells, leading to impaired neutrophil recruitment. That's what we see in Job syndrome, hyper IgE, and obviously we don't see reduced serum IgE, we see elevated IgE. And by the way, what else we see in um, Job syndrome? We see problem with bone, we see problem with skin, and very interestingly, babies retain their teeth, their baby teeth. Oh, we have that here. Patients with hyper-IG syndrome develop, they develop bone fractures from minor trauma, right? They have the bone problems. They don't develop early loss of their baby teeth, they develop prolonged retention of their baby teeth. So if a patient, child, let's say, comes in with bone fractures from minor trauma, we wanna check them for hyper-IG syndrome along with possibly osteogenesis and perfecta. All right, patients with chronic muc mucocutaneous candidiasis develop. So what do they get? They get candida infections. We spoke about this in our air discussion, that, that uh, there's an associated with defects in air. Air is involved in negative selection. Air is one behind the whole negative selection. So if you see a problem with air, there's gonna be a problem with negative selection leading to a T cell defect. And that's exactly what we see in chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. We see a T cell defect leading to all the symptoms seen in this condition, including candida infection. Question 110, what is the most common cause of SCID? It's actually not adenosine deaminase deficiency, it's cytokine receptor defect, inherited in X-linked fashion, as opposed to adenosine deaminase, which is autosomal recessive. Question 11, a defect in the ATMG leads to? So this is ataxia telangiectasia, cerebellar defects, and spider angiomas. This is due to the ATM gene defect, leading to failure to detect DNA. Sorry, a failure to detect DNA damage. So it's gonna to lead to de de defective DNA. Defective CD40 ligand leads to, so this is what we see in hyper IgM syndrome. Hyper IgM, because we're not able to change from IgM in the naive B cell to other forms. So we see reduced levels of IgG, IgA, IgE, but of course IgM will be produced and lots of it because we're able to do the development of B cells, we just can't change to other forms. We just can't class switch. Patients with hyper IgM syndrome are at most risk for pneumonia. Okay, I'm just gonna go on to the next one. Question 115, a patient with WASP gene mutation most likely has, what's, what's the triad? Eczema and thrombocytopenia, as well as pyogenic infections, recurrent infections. Which syndrome are we talking about over here? Wiscott algid syndrome, where we see a mutation in the WASP gene. The WASP gene is involved in reorganizing the actin cytoskeleton. And if we have a defect in this, it's gonna to lead to these problems over here. Just something that we need to be aware of. And how is inherited? X-linked recessive fashion. Question 116, patient with Wiscott-Alger syndrome have recurrent, as we mentioned, the third of the triad, pyogenic infections. 
Lucas adhesion deficiency associated with late separation of the umbilical cord? Yes, absolutely. Increased pus? No, reduced pus because we don't have, again, Lucas adhesion deficiency is due to a defect in an integrin, specifically the LFA1 integrin, which um, is involved in migration and chemotaxis of neutrophils. So Lucas adhesion deficiency, we won't have neutrophils at the site of the infection, therefore there will be decreased pus because pus is formed by the dead neutrophils. But we will see, we will see a late separation of the umbilical cord and because neutrophils are involved in the process of separation of the umbilical cord. We're not going to discuss the mechanism. I don't know if it's fully understood, but since we don't have the neutrophils, there will be a later separation of the umbilical cord. All right, so that's question number 117. Question 118, pediatric death syndrome involves a defect in phagosome lysosome fusion, a defect in the list gene, LYST. So we see problems with pyogenic infection because neutrophils, they're able to make it to the site of infection, but they can't kill. So we're gonna see pyogenic infections. We also see these interesting things in histology called giant granules, representing the failed migration and then aggregation. And finally, albinism, which is interestingly due to a trafficking, def trafficking defect because in order to have the pigments, we need proper trafficking. Question 119, patients with chronic granulomatous disease, the nitroblue tetrazoleum dye reduction test just turns blue or does not? It does not turn blue because this test tells us whether or not you're able to convert oxygen to superoxide. If you can't do it, it does not turn blue. It turns blue if you're able to convert oxygen to superoxide. And since these patients don't have NADBH oxidase, they cannot do this conversion. Question 119, pre-existing antibodies in a patient, so they were up to transplant. I'm gonna go through these really quickly because they're really boring and really annoying. Pre-existing antibodies in the patient leading react to donor antigens leading to complement activation. This probably occurred. This is a hyperacute reaction minutes after the transplant. Transplant patients develop the vasculitis of graft vessels with dense interstitial lymphocytic endotrit. This most properly represents an acute transplant rejection. That's the uh, hyperacute, but not present with this vasculitis. Chronic transplant rejection involves pre foreign antibodies against donor antigen leading to widespread thrombosis, a proliferation of vascular smooth muscle and fibrosis. So, chronic, we're going to see the vascular smooth muscle and fibrosis. Acute transplant rejections. Are they reversible? Are they always irreversible? No, they can be reversed with immunosuppressants. Graft versus host disease are almost are so, most associated with graft versus host. This is going to be bone marrow and liver transplant. Again, we mentioned this hypersensitivity type for reaction. All right, graft versus host disease often involves rash and diarrhea. That's patients often develop. Patient develops severe hypertension, tachypnea, and tachycardia. This was probably an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. That's what we classically see. We don't see these in a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. A child develops fever and headache after a transfusion reaction. This describes, this is the febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction classically seen in children. Delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions, are they self-limited or usually require emergency dialysis? Yes, they're generally self-limited. All right, question 129. B cell deficiencies tend to produce recurrent bacterial infections. B for bacterial infections. T cell, T cell deficiencies tend to cause fungal and viral infections. Question 130. Cyclosporins were up to pharmacology for immunology, basically immunosuppressants. Cyclosporin inhibits which molecule? Calcineurin. Calcineurin plays a key role in regulating the transcription of NFAT, which is important for T cell activation by leading to the activation of IL-2 transcription. So if we block IL-2 transcription, we won't be able to activate the T cells, and that's what cyclosporin does. It inhibits calcineurin, preventing IL-2 transcription. Cyclosporin and tacrolimus both, what do they both do? They both prevent IL-2 transcription through this mechanism of of inhibiting calcineurin. As we said before, we said cyclosporin inhibits calcineurin. These things prevent IL-2 transcription through this method. How do we prevent the response to IL-2? So that would be something like serolimus, where, which is involved in blocking the response to IL-2 by inhibiting MTOR, which is how IL-2 receptor communicates directly. Tacrolimus toxicity includes nephrotoxicity, very important, and neurotoxicity. So you don't want to give tacrolimus to someone who already has kidney problems. Gingival hyperplasia and hirsutism will not be seen in tacrolimus, it will be seen in cyclosporin. Serolimus is given for to prevent kidney transplant rejection. It's not nephrotoxic uh, like cyclosporin. Azathioprine works as an immunosuppressant by, how does azathioprine work? So I think we spoke about this in biochemistry, but it blocks nucleotide synthesis. That's what azathioprine does, and it blocks nucleotide synthesis, specifically purine synthesis. Um, toxicities include pancytopenia. That makes sense. It's caught, it, it, it causes reduced DNA synthesis by reducing purine synthesis. So we'll have fewer immune cells too. Mycophenolate inhibits purine synthesis as well. Patients who take mycophenolate often develop, what do they develop? They develop GI symptoms and pancytopenia, similar to what we mentioned before. Basiliximab. So what is basiliximab? So this is a monoclonal antibody. Well, it's a monoclonal antibody, but it's not anti-CD25. It prevents IL-2 receptor response. So it's a monoclonal antibody. 
it's a monoclonal antibody that kind of works similar to Sirolimus, but it doesn't act on MTOR. It actually directly blocks the receptor, the IL-2 receptor. So that's what axamab is. Um, glucocorticoids inhibit and F-kappa B. We mentioned this before. That's how they work. Glucocorticoid toxicities. So we know this. It could lead to Cushing syndrome and osteoporosis. Not hypoglycemia, but hyperglycemia. Filgrastim and sargamastrum are used to, what are they used for? They're used for stimulate production of neutrophils. They're colonizing, colony stimulating factors. That's what they do. They're used in leukopenias to increase the granulocyte and monocyte count, and this includes neutrophils. That's what they're used for. You may see them used, um, spoken more of as GMCSF, GMCSF, as well as GCSF. These are filgrastim and sargastrum, other, other names for them. Interferon alpha is used for hepatitis. Interferon beta is used for MS. I don't think I've ever heard of interferon beta in anything except the context of MS, multiple sclerosis. Adalimab works by binding to TNF alpha. It's a TNF alpha inhibitor. That's what it does. And by the way, when in which condition do you use adalimab? Conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, IBD, ankylosing spondylitis, and psoriasis, where we want to stop the immune system. So we want to stop the inflammation. That's why we block TNF alpha. 145. Who should not take adalimab? Interesting, we should be aware of who should not take it. So patients with tuberculosis or CMV should not take it. Bad associations. Children, it's totally fine for them to take it. Perhaps not newborns, but children can take adalimab. Paroxysmal octanoral hemoglobinuria can be treated with? Well, what's the problem in paroxysmal octanoral hemoglobinuria? Remember, there is a problem with daphnemeryl, and therefore there's going to be overactivation of complements. We want to have something that's going to stop activation of complement. Which one of these stops complement? Eculomizumab that stops most notably the complement protein C5. So we block C5, blocks activation of complement. That's why it's used to treat paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria where there's overactivation of complement. Natalizumab works by, what, how does natalizumab work? Well, it prevents leukocyte migration. That's why we use it in multiple sclerosis and Crohn's disease, because again, we want to suppress the immune response and specifically the leukocyte migration. All right, 148. By the way, it's really number 150. Question number 150, it just like doubled up on two of the questions. Palavizumab works by palavizumab. It's a viral, it binds a viral fusion protein. It doesn't bind to IgE. Binding to IgE, what would bind to IgE? That would be something like omalizumab. Omalizumab binds to IgE and it inhibits it. And that's used to treat um, refractory, a refractory allergic asthma. But palavizumab is used as a prophylaxis for RSV because it binds to the RSV fusion protein. That's why it's used to it's prophylaxis for RSV. All right, congratulations. We finished our immunology section. Stay tuned for our videos on microbiology, pathology, and pharmacology, and please leave your comments. The feedback really helps. All righty, take care.